Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Torsellini, and in this episode, we'll discuss ways of bringing fresh air into buildings and the energy consequences associated with doing that. In a previous episode, we discussed the impacts of infiltration and exfiltration. We said that building envelopes are filled with cracks and have materials that are permeable to air. In older buildings, these show up as cold drafts in the wintertime and can also cause comfort issues. Most new buildings have substantially reduced these leaks, but they are still there. Air leaving buildings is energy lost, and the air that comes in must be conditioned, either heated in the heating season or cooled and dehumidified in the summertime. We discussed the equations to calculate this heat loss or gain in a previous episode and realized that it can be a significant portion of the total heating and cooling needs of a building. There is more to this story, however. We all need fresh air as a basic survival need. Humans inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. We need to get rid of the carbon dioxide from the building and bring in oxygen. There are other pollutants that we also want to get rid of as well. As we really can't get rid of pollutants directly from the source of these pollutants, we often maintain air quality in buildings by diluting the pollutants with fresh air. The solution to pollution is dilution. As we strive to make buildings tighter for energy efficiency, we risk having them so tight that we don't have enough fresh air to dilute the pollutants in the space. While the science of actual concentrations of carbon dioxide and health impacts is still in its infancy, ASHRAE has created a standard, standard 62, that addresses the amount of ventilation air that is needed. Typically, the recommendation is somewhere around 15 to 20 cubic feet per minute per person. And while that might only apply for when a person is in the space, some amount of ventilation should be provided when the building is not occupied. As an example, let's look at a sample building that we looked at in other episodes. We had specified an air exchange rate of 0.2 air changes per hour, or ACH. The volume of this house was 10,000 cubic feet. For 0.2 ACH, we write that this is 0.2 air changes per hour and multiply it by 10,000 cubic feet per air change. We then divide by 60 minutes per hour and the result is 33 cubic feet per minute or 33 CFM. This is barely enough fresh air for two people and this house is not that tight with current building standards. For reference, a very tight house would have an air exchange rate of 0.03 air ACH. So this would yield 5 CFM, which is certainly not enough fresh air for occupants. The benefit is that energy consumption for infiltration is reduced 85% by going from 0.2 to 0.03 ACH. The bottom line is that we need to increase the ventilation air. We can just add a fan and bring in more outside air, but remember, not only does the fan use energy, but we also need to condition the outside air that comes in. Sometimes the ventilation is exhaust only. For this, we would either need a fan to remove some air or create a hole in the building and let some air out. Bathroom fans, dryer vents, range hood vents all extract air from the building. This will depressurize the house to the point that it will magnify the cracks in the house until the air coming in matches the air going out. The depressurization takes energy, so this is not the most effective way to move air. Having a neutral pressure from inside to out will maximize the amount of ventilation for the amount of energy that is put in. Sometimes we talk about the watts per CFM to express the efficiency of moving the air. It is dependent on how hard it is to move the air. If we have to depressurize the building and the efficiency of the fan and motor. Remember that this discussion still does not account for the energy to condition the air that we bring in from outside. 
For this discussion, we will think about heating the air. Heat is lost when we discharge the heat to the outside. Ideally, though, we could try to take some of that heat and use it to heat the air that enters the building. The most common way to do this is with an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. The typical configuration for this is shown on the screen. As air leaves the building, it goes through a heat exchanger, which transfers that heat into the incoming airstream, heating it up a little. A typical air-to-air -air heat exchanger can recover 60 to 70 percent of the heat from the outgoing air. This means that we only need to add 30 to 40 percent of the amount of heat we would normally would have if we did not have the heat exchanger. This amount of heat saved can be significant. The square box in the middle of the diagram is the heat exchanger. It is made up of passageways that are perpendicular to each other. Air from one passageway heats up the air heat exchanger and the heat is added to the airflow in the other passageway. Fans are used to move air through the heat exchanger. Sometimes the fans are arranged such that there is only one motor that runs both fans. This is not the only configuration of heat exchangers. Sometimes a rotating disc is used to transfer the heat, especially on larger commercial systems. Sometimes air is pulled from the areas of a building where there are pollutants, including kitchens and bathrooms. Fresh air is often dumped into the return of the furnace system's ductwork and is used to distribute conditioned air throughout the building. If there is no air distribution system, fresh air is introduced into the areas of the building where there is higher occupancy. In the case of a house, this might be the living room and the bedrooms. In cooling mode, the flows are the same, but now instead of recovering heat, we are cooling the incoming air with cool air that is leaving. Heat exchangers that only transfer sensible heat, that is only temperature, have a difficult time recovering much cool from the heat exchanger as the temperature differences are small. A different type of heat exchanger has the ability to also transfer moisture. A significant portion of air conditioning in humid climates is dehumidifying air. That is the energy associated with pulling the water out of the air and condensing it. Moisture is pulled from the hot, humid air entering the building and is added to the dry air leaving the building. This is called an enthalpy heat exchanger to represent the movement of both moisture and sensible heat. Moving energy with moisture is called latent heat. The industry typically calls these units that exchange both latent and sensible heat energy recovery ventilators, or ERVs. The sensible only heat exchangers are called heat recovery ventilators, or HRVs. As a caution, however, this works well in humid climates. As the climate becomes cooler and the heating loads dominate, the energy recovery ventilator will take the humidity from the air and add it to the cold air entering the space. You must be careful here as humidity can build up in the space as humidity is generated from cooking, bathing, and perspiration. Too much humidity in the space will start to condense on cooler surfaces, such as windows. This is an indication that there is too much humidity. A heat recovery ventilator can take this excess moisture, condense it in the heat exchanger, and recover that heat as sensible heat to warm up the incoming air. There are other strategies to ventilate buildings, especially when heat is generated in the building. One such method is natural ventilation, where windows are designed such there is good cross ventilation breezes, or such that hot air can rise out of open windows, bringing fresh cooler area through open lower windows. How to design these systems can be complex and is beyond the scope of this episode. Remember, the key is to maintain fresh air in the building for occupants and to do it in an energy efficient way. That's all for this episode. Please let us know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.